you get to the point where you're confident and knowledge builds confidence and confidence allows you to play fast. And at that point, in the, those last two games, that's what it felt like. Uh, I was extremely impressed with them. Um, we got to we got to do a great job recruiting him back and I told someone to be the biggest recruit since my wife. Um, and that's, you know, we got to do a good job with that. And I'm excited to, you know, get back here and talk to him and visit uh, face to face as well. And welcome into GC Live. That, of course, new South Carolina offensive coordinator, Dow Loggins, uh, speaking on South Carolina quarterback Spencer Rattler, the biggest recruit since his wife, according to South Carolina's new quarterbacks coach and OC. Of course, Loggins being introduced to the media and South Carolina fans today, a pretty lengthy Shane Beamer press conference that was then followed by Loggins' press conference as well. If you want to watch or listen to those in uh, their complete fashion, you can go to GamecockCentral.com or just go to the Gamecock Central YouTube. Uh, the full pressers, both about 30 minutes each, are on both those platforms. Otherwise, Chris and I are going to sort of break down some things that caught our attention, caught our eyes, and uh, we're actually going to play a few clips. I had some time uh, in between the end because it was a morning presser uh, to actually grab a few little quick clips. So I'm going to play those as well, and then Chris and I will, re will react to it. Uh, but, yeah, welcome in. Wednesday episode, GC Live. We told you yesterday we didn't know when we would be back. However, plenty to talk about, Chris, plenty to get to. We talked a little bit about logins and the hire on the surface yesterday. I figured um, we learned as much as you can from a press conference setting today. Uh, what's your first, I guess, initial reaction? We were on the 107.5 show this morning. Didn't have a ton of time to necessarily dive all completely into it. We have plenty of time here on GC Live. So uh, thank everyone for joining us. Uh, Chris, the floor is yours. What was your first thought? Well, I, I got to start with this. Um, Shane Beamer was fired up, man. He came with uh, some receipts, as he typically does. Um, he had some thoughts, and he was pretty fired up. And, look, I, <laughs> I think um, we know that Beamer wears his emotions on his sleeve. And um, – we know that in a lot of instances he's he's going to say what he thinks, and he's definitely. I mean, will he give coach speak at times, like all head coaches do? Sure, but I think he's not afraid to come out and say exactly what he's thinking. And he did some of that today, and I think a lot of it was based on uh, some things that have been written and him feeling the need to, I think, kind of correct the narrative, so to speak, on what he perceives has been out there about Dowell Loggins versus what he saw during the process and tried to detail some of that. He had a list of guys he talked to, Wes, from the college ranks and the NFL ranks and all the research that he did on Dowell Loggins, talked about him as a person, as a play caller, and as a recruiter. And then I thought it was uh, cool to get to hear from Dowell Loggins and hear him answer some questions for quite a while. I think we were actually able to learn some things, Wes, about you know, maybe not getting into the nitty gritty of, you know, what what do you expect on third down if it's third and seven from Dow Loggins? We don't know that, right? Um, but just hearing kind of his philosophy and what he wants to do from a play calling standpoint and how he wants to fit it to the players that South Carolina is going to have next season, um, I thought there was a there was a lot to dive into there. Yeah, there really was, and and like I said, I've got some clips. I tried to really just cut it down to some things that caught my attention. We really can't get into all of it because um, then I would just be playing the entire thing. But, again, if you really want to hear all the details, it's about 30 minutes. Go listen to it. Go watch it. But I really felt, Chris, and, again, you know, it's a press conference. Uh, coaches win press conferences all the time. But I, I felt like there was a sense of understanding of the jump from – sort of an NFL approach to running an offense to the college approach. And I think these two years at Arkansas, it appears have been very uh, fruitful for him as far as learning a little bit about that adjustment. Shouldn't say a little bit, probably a lot about that adjustment. And one thing I, I picked up on, I, I was listening to a podcast earlier today where uh, they were sitting down with Loggins and sort of talking about his journey. He is a very curious guy. And he's one of these people that um, sort of uh, – will have an observation and then we'll want to kind of dive into it. And so I, I think those are kind of the people, people that are always learning, people that are always willing to learn, even if they've coached at the NFL level, they've been in ball their whole life, really. It's a guy that 
uh, had no designs of being a you know an NFL quarterback. He knew coaching was going to be in his future, and he really worked at the college level when he was a walk on at Arkansas to sort of prime himself to get into this. And so I, I think um, he, he's a guy. It was interesting to me, Chris, to hear him talk about what he's seen as the differences between the NFL game and the college game. And a big part of it is something we talked about for the, I mean, greater part of the last two seasons. This idea of pro-style offense on, on one side versus college kids, the 20-hour rule, how complicated can you make it, and how how much can you streamline it. He used that word, Marcus Satterfield used that word at the end of the year after the Tennessee game. Can you streamline it? And we saw South Carolina finally kind of unlock that at the end of the year. A lot of the same plays, Chris. It, these were not new concepts they were running at the end of the year, but they streamlined how you get to it. And my biggest takeaway, yeah, we don't know what the what the third and two uh, go-to play is going to be. We don't know if the personnel is going to be two tight ends or four wide receivers. All that is to be determined. My biggest takeaway from a big-picture standpoint was that kind of a similar offense, I think, to what we saw at the end of the year. Probably add in some Kendall Bryles touch, some sort of um, Bryles coaching tree, spread the field. You heard him say um, space and pace quite a bit. He talked about the difference in the hash marks in the NFL where you're like this college or actually uh, basically you you have – a greater which which hash you're on has a greater impact in college because you have field and boundary, whereas the NFL you're more centered basically. So I, I thought it kind of fits what we saw at the end of the year. Um, and then he talked about verbiage. I've got a good um, clip on that. But Chris, it seemed like again to try to simplify what I'm trying to say. A lot of what we saw at the end of last year, plus. Some Arkansas spread, Bryles influence, all encompassed by trying to streamline it into some shorter calls, verbiage, and just packaging all this up. Well, and and isn't that the theme of when things went wrong the past couple years with Marcus Satterfield and this Gamecock offense, just in general, let's generalize it. Let's streamline what we're saying, as you said. You know, that was the biggest thing, right? Not that, well, gosh, the – this play design doesn't make any sense. Like some people said that. Why did you call this in the, on this down and distance? That surely comes up, right? Or even something like, why are you running so many zone concepts? Or why are you running the duo play? Like those things did come up, right? But the biggest overarching number one thing that we consistently heard and that was obviously an issue was just things like carrying too much into game week, having things being overly complex, maybe sometimes running some things that your players have not repped as much. Now contrast that with what we saw the past two weeks or the last two weeks of the season, rather. It wasn't – everybody was in a mad rush at the end of the year to, oh, my gosh, they, they scored so many points. There has to be a different play caller or there has to be – they had to have thrown out the entire offense and installed something new. And in reality, it wasn't those things. It was that they very much honed in, focused in, cut down the amount of plays that they were carrying into the game, cut down what they were repping during the week, and just streamlined it, like you said, Wes, to where the players would go out, able to go out and do what Dow Loggins said at the beginning of that clip, play fast, and they were able to go out and execute much better. Um, so clearly there was something to that notion, and something we talked about, Wes, I think yesterday – on here on the show was just looking at that and trying to harness that and recapture that spirit. Will there be some plays that are different? Sure. But a lot of the things that they did this past season throughout the year conceptually were okay. They did a lot better running them at the end of the year. And so uh, no matter what the offense looks like, there'll be some similarities from what we saw uh, the past two years for sure. There will also be some differences for sure, but being able to give the players things that they can go execute quickly and something that was talked about again today that you mentioned was, you know, just the verbiage and how you're installing and how much you're installing. 
I think those are very, very important aspects along with, sure, the scheme's important. What you call on a third and four is important. But what are you doing to coach your guys up and make sure that they're in good position to execute it? Yeah, certainly. And I, I think, Chris, you look and um, he even mentioned wanting to sit down with Spencer and that's sort of assuming that you get Spencer back. And, and certainly some of that's going to be kind of recruiting Spencer back and getting an idea of what he wants this offense to be, getting an idea of what he's looking for moving forward. But, Chris, I, I thought um, intriguing to hear him say, you know, I assuming Spencer is back, saying, I want to talk to Spencer about – what what he likes? What is he what is he most comfortable with? What concepts um, does he feel like he can most go play free within? And so I, I think um, you know a lot of it I would imagine is going to look somewhat like we saw at the end of last year. At the same time, there's always going to be an influence with a new coach, and I, I think some of it's just going to be like we said, just getting to it a little bit more of a compact way and. Um, I thought, uh, by the way, I've, I've got this thing, again, clipped up. This matches perfectly with what we're talking about. So, real quick, here is um, Loggins talking about that very thing, verbiage and uh, verbiage in the NFL versus college, but then possibly being able to do some of these NFL concepts without all the verbiage. And then you come to college football, you're like, oh, man, they got class. They're 18 years old. I can't – I don't remember what it was like when I was 18, but – I had a lot of crap going on in my life that football wasn't always the the most important thing. I had to study. I had to find a girlfriend. Uh, you know, I had to hang out with the boys and all that stuff. So what I have learned, I've told my friends in uh, pro coaching that there's a disconnect there and you and it comes with verbiage. And I made the comment earlier um, to my guy from Cleveland that uh, um, the knowledge builds confidence and confidence allows you to play fast. And some of that is reducing verbiage as much as you can to make it fit where it still makes sense. And you don't have to have a 17-word play call. And I don't, I don't know that I would have known that if I didn't come for two years and watch college football and, and understand exactly what these guys are being taught because these NFL offenses, offenses are awesome and they, they are super sophisticated. And you also get paid and you're full-time. That, that's your job, full-time. You're expected to be there at 7 o'clock and leave at 5 o'clock compared to a 20 hour rule. So it's crazy to think that we're going to try to have pro style concepts like that they've had here. Obviously they're, they're very sound that way, but how, how much can we reduce the terminology and still be efficient and streamlining the, the biggest thing I've learned from college football was the space and pace of the game and the ability to communicate with signals and as a uh, few words as possible. And that, that's you, what I've been impressed with is how fast these kids learn a signal opposed to words. For whatever reason, it just hits their brain and where you don't even have to say something, but you give a signal and everybody knows what to do. And there's a lot more one-word play calls in college football. And I think that's where the biggest transition for a college quarterback is going from college football to pro football. Um, but you can still run pro-style concepts and be able to communicate and signal in a fast way. That to me, that that last sentence, you can still run pro style concepts and be able to communicate um, and signal in a fast way, um, might be the most succinct way to sum up my takeaway from the entire press conference because I think that is the key. And I, I think you know there was another quote that I thought was very interesting, Chris, and I can't even remember which little clip it's in, but it it was not. Let me say it like this. I don't think it was a shot at anyone else because I really doubt he's paid any attention to the South Carolina press conferences um, from this past season. But did you catch the the little quote there where he said, I don't want to come into a press conference and have to ask a question. Why didn't this guy catch the – why did this guy only catch the ball two times? Why did this running back only run the ball nine times? Um, I really don't – like sometimes there's deeper meaning. I don't think he meant it any type of way, but it did strike me just how fitting that comment was compared to many of the questions that have taken place around here the last couple of years. Yeah, for sure. And, hey, I mean, I'm with you. No, no shot intended, I don't think, there. But did that come up at all, like, in his conversations with Shane Beamer? I mean, you, you would, you would have – 
you yeah, I mean, you would think one of Dow Loggins' questions, I mean, you think about a guy being interviewed for a job or pursued for a job. Well, they're going to have questions too uh, for the head coach of the program. And one of them, you know, is going to be, well, what did you see? What are the problems there at your program? Uh, why did, why were you able to flip that switch from struggling against Georgia State in game one, having a lot of struggles against Arkansas that Dow Loggins referenced to the last two games and scoring 63 points against Tennessee in a game? Um, how you know what happened? What changed? What did you see? What are the strengths and weaknesses? And so um, those things probably did come up. And so you know, Shane Beamer, some of his feedback is probably well, we didn't always consistently get the ball to our playmakers, or maybe some of the things, some of our play calls were too wordy, or maybe we carried too much into games. And so you can see Dowell Loggins as he goes through it here. If you are going to do a good job, you know, as a coach, you're going to take things that have not been done as well and try to fix those. And you're going to take the things that have done well and try to expand upon them and continue them. And so I think we heard, you know, some of that for both of them. Now, obviously, we have to wait and see. We're not going to have any real actual baseline against competition that's not South Carolina, not the spring game, not practice until next year in September of 2023, we'll have at least, we'll st be able to start gathering some data on how this goes. Um, but it does appear from what he's saying uh, that he is looking to do exactly what we said there. And that is take what's good, continue that, expand upon that, and then take the things that need to be changed. And he's, I think he was very specific in referencing some of those things, Wes. Yeah, I think that's a great point, man. Um, you got to wonder. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for those conversations because, I mean, Chris, let, let's be honest. Shane Beamer is a guy who um, is going to defend his his family. Like He's going to defend his people. He's going to defend his program. And he had to answer questions throughout um, the better part of two seasons about the offense. And – you know, at times he he raised some some points that were absolutely valid, and you know they did have to go through four different quarterbacks last year and bring uh, a GA from uh, you know his retirement into playing on the field again. You know they had Doty playing hundred, you know not near a hundred percent health. So I, I think um, some of it was was certainly warranted, and then there were times last year certainly before the last two games where, you know, you kind of almost felt bad that, uh, you know, it's kind of like, what do you, what do you even say at this point? You know, after, like after the Florida game, you know what, but as the leader, you defend your, your program. I think that's just what you do. I felt like now that things have kind of passed, Satterfield has moved on. Satterfield has a new start there. South Carolina has their new start here. You saw a little glimpse of maybe some of the here here are what he maybe internally thought the issues were that led to the output not being what they hoped it was. And I think we saw the last couple of weeks. And with this decision here, I do think Beamer meant what he said throughout the two years when he said, guys, it's closer than you think. Like it just it's not quite there, but it's closer than you think. But him mentioning the consistency or lack of consistency, and I can't remember, Chris, I need to go back and listen. I don't think he used the word simplify, but even Beamer sort of hinted at something he'd hinted at, I guess, a little bit before, but never really seemed to come out and completely say that, all right, I kind of like the big picture of where we are as an approach. But yes, something was missing in the consistency of being able to put it all together. It, it was. He has used that word inconsistency a good bit. Um, you know, he's said it in his public statements that they just haven't been consistent enough on offense. And we saw, right, those those waves. This is something we've talked about in the past, like the extreme ups and downs of this program. And they wanted to be more consistent as a football team, certainly offensively, but just as a football team this year. And 
they were able to do that in some ways, but in some we in some ways we did still see those extreme ups and downs, right? And that is why, you know, last season, I think there was a stretch, Wes. I'm I'm not gonna get the the exact like tipping point right or or like the cutoff date. But there was a point last year where South Carolina didn't win or lose two games in a row at all. It was just win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. You know, so you had the Florida game, then something bad, then the Auburn game. Um, this year, you know, we saw more of that. We saw South Carolina have the tough loss to Arkansas, the the blowout against Georgia. Then you see a really, really good stretch where they beat up on the teams they're supposed to. They beat A&M and Kentucky. But here comes the Missouri game and and the the egg that they laid there. Then here comes the Florida game and another big-time laid egg to the point where it seems like people – you know, and, and by people, I mean fans, and it's okay if if you're listening to this and it was one of you, you know, or like jumping off, saying there's no way we can beat Tennessee. I didn't pick South Carolina to beat Tennessee, put myself in there. I picked them to lose by like 40 points or something, but yet he kept them on the same track. Um, and I think for some, and probably for Shane Beamer, He's sitting around going, this is what we could have done the whole year. This is what we should have been. And so what are those missing ingredients to unlock that? We know that you have to have talent on your football team, which this offense did for most of the season. But what are the things that kept them from doing that on a more consistent basis and output? And I think, Wes, it's a lot of those things that Beamer talked about today. Now that he's got some separation from that situation, it's a great point by you that He's opened up a little bit more on that. And I think it's some of the things that Dow Loggins was talking about today as well. Yeah, so the, those things, again, all the details I think are going to be kind of figured out as they go once they figure out who's on the roster, uh, you know, frankly. But you did get, I think, at least an idea of what the mindset is going to be with this offense going into next year. And obviously the spring will be massive as we start to sort of sort through what that does look like. And – Chris, I, I thought it was interesting today, bowl wise, bowl talk wise. How about Beamer sort of just saying, Yeah, I know who's going to call plays, but I'm, we're keeping this in house. I, that was one thing I was very curious about. I was hoping we might find out who the guy was going to be. Clearly, it's going to be a team effort to put the game plan together. That's not that different than any other week, I don't think. And clearly, you'll probably see them add some, if, if, History is a guide two years now of watching Shane Beamer teams. There's going to be some wrinkles when they have some time to do extra prep. And it's probably going to be some special teams trick plays, breaking news. But that's that's what we see from this group. But very interesting that Beamer, I don't know if I've seen this with coaches. I know coaches inherently are um, a little bit paranoid on stuff. They just are. But I don't know if I've seen a coach be like, I'm just not telling y'all. Who's calling the plays for this game? Uh, yep. So I guess, do we, I mean, is there an interim OC in the building even? Or is it kind of just like, we're going to all do what we do and we're just not telling anybody who's dialing these things up on on game day? Well, at some point, uh, somebody is going to come on the headset and say, this is the play, right? And so uh, Beamer did mention it was going to be a team effort. And so you would think, in that regard, it's going to be more collaborative than in the past. And I think things were a little bit more collaborative the last couple weeks of the season. Anyway, a, a little bit more collaborative, at least. It may be very collaborative going into the bowl game. And so um, Shane Beamer hasn't ruled out him calling plays. That would be interesting. Um, and it certainly could be somebody else. There's not really anybody in the building that you can point to who's an on-field coach, who you say, oh, yeah, it's clearly going to be that guy, right? Um, th- there's there's not really anyone there because there's not a guy that has just tons of play-calling experience or really out of the position coaches. I don't think there's anybody that's called plays, you know, at, at the college level or any level. So, And that's talking about the on-field coaches now, not, say, Freddie Kitchens at the analyst position does have a couple of years – of calling plays at the NFL level. So it'll be interesting, um, you know, how they configure everything, but it appears that we are not going to know unless we somehow uncover that, Wes, 
uh, for public consumption, which we may not heading into the bowl game. I feel like we can get an idea of it, but yep. whether or not we're given the go-ahead by whoever gives us the idea uh, <laughs> will right. be a completely other discussion, I think. But um, so let's see. I, I think that's about all I have on um, the presser itself. I do have – let's see. I don't remember which ones I've actually clicked and played. I'm going to give you all – one more. Um, let's go with this one. I got one more clip of logins on Scheme, and then we'll dive in to uh, some of the decommitment news real quick and uh, more transfer portal news that has just come out today. Um, so here's logins talking a little bit of Scheme on uh, on the Wednesday press conference. The th- I know I don't want to be – I told uh, Steve this. I don't want to speak in a bunch of coaching cliches. You guys are going to find this out about me. I want to be very honest and very transparent with everything. And for me to make any kind of statement of anything other than the truth right now would be like just propaganda. Uh, is maximize our players. Like really find out what we have. I don't know right now. And we need spring ball, Rick, to find that out. I need to know what these guys can do. Our staff's going to do – they'll be able to fill me in on – their opinions and um, of expectations and what a guy can and can't do. But we really want to build an offense that um, obviously, number one, I think the most important thing about offense is you create pressure on defense. And you can do that in a lot of ways. you got to create conflict, whether that be RPOs, tempo, um, play action passes. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. But offense, defense especially, is really about creating pressure on the opponent. And the way to do that is you find out who your playmakers are and put them in spots that create conflict on the defense. And that's how I think that well, the one thing in college football um, that you have to attack is 53 and a third. Like everyone wants to attack vertical, but in college it's, it's space and pace. That's a real thing. You know, I've watched for two years uh, our offense and, um, that we evolved in. It's not Baylor. It wasn't Ole Miss, you know, the versions of it there, but it was also with the ability to run the football and going really, really fast wasn't always the answer, but being able to play with tempo is. So we're really going to try to find out um, what our players can do. Starting with, and I, I think there's a priority in that. It starts with quarterback, and then it goes to offensive line, and then you find out what your skill guys do well. But you have to build it that way through the quarterback size and the offensive line, and then how do we get our skill guys the ball? So I hope that to be successful is that we create balance, which means multiple touches for our playmakers. And we don't come in here after a game and have a conversation about, hey, why did so-and-so only have two catches? Or why did so-and-so only have, you know, nine carries and, and those things that, that you hope that you maximize your players? Hey, I picked the right one. I actually didn't realize that was even where that quote was. But, yeah, I mean, he, he said all the right things, I think. And uh, we'll certainly see where it goes from here. And I think a big thing – for him at this point, he obviously is not going to be the OC for the bowl game. For about a stretch here, Chris, it's going to be all about recruiting. It's going to be about connecting with the guys that are committed. Uh, you talked to Dante Reno already, and uh, he has already talked to Dante Reno. Uh, we are working on getting feedback from Lenore Sellers, South Carolina's 2023 quarterback target, who is currently committed to Syracuse, but the Gamecocks have made a big priority as of late. Uh, from what I've been told, the two of them, have already connected. They've already talked, um, but I'm still working on getting everyone some feedback on what that conversation was like. But, Chris, at this point, it's co- I think the next few weeks for him really are probably a lot of phone calls. I would mm-hmm. And then this weekend, uh, you know, Beamer made note as well, going to be a bunch of guys on campus for South Carolina and, um, you know, an opportunity for them to meet him and, and sort of get to know him in person, which I think will be big not just for uncommitted guys, but will be big for some committed guys as well. Um, Hopefully they'll go read about it on Gamecock Central, but how was your conversation with Dante after his conversation with Dow Loggins? Yeah, and and Dante is a very, you know, positive guy, South Carolina's 2024 commitment. Uh, He's had his recruiting hat on firmly ever since he committed to the Gamecocks and been really involved in trying to get more talent from even the 23 class and certainly his class in 2024 and beyond really been working on that class. And so I think he'll have an opportunity to 
uh, be on campus. Dante Reno will visit Columbia this weekend. He'll be among the visitors. Um, we'll be able to sit down with Loggins and talk talk more ball, uh, but also just get to know each other. But, yeah, early returns there were fantastic. Uh, Loggins really seemed to <clears throat> indicate that he liked what he saw from Reno's film and his skill set and how it could fit in. And then on the other side of that, Reno was really impressed with Loggins as a person and excited about what he's planning on doing from a schematic standpoint too. So seemed like a, a good early conversation and a, and a good fit there. Yeah. And I'm sure they'll dive into things this weekend and really start to get to know each other. I, I think, um, you know, not that you can always tell man, but it was pretty easy for me to see why um, Loggins has been deemed to be such a good recruiter already, even though he's only had a couple of years back in college ball. Um, that's one thing that all the Arkansas guys seem to point out is, you know, this guy's just been a natural on the recruiting trail. And, you know, Chris, you and I have talked quite a bit, though. A lot of recruiting is, are you a natural relationship building person? Can you connect with people? And are you willing to work at it? And, you know, I, I think uh, based on his track record in those couple of years, add it with what we saw from him just in the brief, you know, 30-minute press conference, the, uh, you know, trying to make connections with people, trying to remember people's names, um, connecting on NFL teams. You know, I, I think um, you could kind of see, j just like, you know, I referenced this the other day, Sterling Lucas with South Carolina. Didn't have a long track record or really any track record as a recruiter. Talk to anybody who's been around him. Talk to anybody in that building over there. They'll tell you, Sterling Lucas is a heck of a recruiter. He's going to have a great career in that field. And it was pretty easy for me to sort of be like, okay, yeah, I can see how this guy could connect with people. And uh, I imagine we're going to get some really positive feedback Um from what we hear from guys coming out of this weekend and, and sort of going into the next couple of weeks with early signing period starting next Wednesday. Yeah, I, I think that was a great comparison with Sterling Lucas because <clears throat> obviously he was a guy that we knew was going to have to make some quick headway recruiting edge players, um, you know, at South Carolina because of the needs there. And he's done a good job on the trail since he's gotten hired. And since he didn't have that track record, I mean, he had been in a, at NC State in, in the weight room, basically, or as a GA, but most of his career had been spent on the NFL field where you're not recruiting. And so then you go to, well, hey, you talk to people, what kind of recruiter can this guy be? And if you hear that he's personable and knows how to connect with people and will work at it, which, is, I mean, all, all points you've already made, Wes, and wants to be good at it, then that guy's going to have a chance. And so we heard all those things about Sterling Lucas, and I think those have come to fruition. And so with Loggins, we do have those attributes that we've heard, but we also have a, a short track record in college, right? But there is a track record, and from what we've seen, it's a good one. So uh, did a did a really good job in this class of recruiting his position at Arkansas, which was tight ends. Certainly you look at what he's done there, and it is pretty impressive. So – um, early returns appear to be that he's going to be well suited on the college recruiting trail. Yep. And again, be on the lookout. We are efforting getting a Lenora Sellers reaction to speaking with uh, Dow Loggins for the first time. We'll hopefully have that later on today on GamecockCentral.com. Uh, come, sub come subscribe. $10 will get you from now until the start of next season. And, uh, Chris, some news actually as we were live slash recording here. Corey Rucker, South Carolina wide receiver, reportedly in the transfer portal. And, um, you know, it, it's an interesting loss for South Carolina. I think somewhat underlines the fact that I can already almost feel fans getting, what's the word? They're, they're sort of not immune to the losses at this point but they're starting to be numbed a little bit to it. Like, it was like, oh, my gosh, Jaheim Bell. Oh, my gosh, Marshawn Lloyd. And then it's, oh, okay, somebody else. Like, okay, this is just the new normal in college football. You look at the numbers of guys that have transferred out from other programs as well, and some of them starters, some of them guys that project to play a bunch. I think Corey Rucker, certainly if he stayed, 
was going to be in line to play a ton next year. Like, there's a lot of positive buzz about this guy. Rightfully so. He's a heck of a football player. Um, you know, it, it did sort of seem, it felt like there was a little frustration just being injured this year. When I talked to him on the Garnet Trust interview, um, you know, he, he told me, I've, I've never been injured like this before. Never missed time. Corey is one of those guys that his mind is constantly churning. He needs to he needs to have something to keep him engaged. And uh, he's in a new place as a transfer, a place that's far from home. And I you know I don't want to speculate, but um, may, maybe this was different if he was on the field. No fault of anyone's. Maybe this was different if he was on the field and able to be engaged with the with the team on the field and making things happen. But um, it just obviously this season, again, no fault of anyone's, didn't go the way he planned coming in. So I'll, I'll be curious to see what his uh, direction ends up being moving forward. But it does appear to be true, Rucker, in the transfer portal. Yeah, the direction uh, will be interesting. The, the reasoning, again, we're learning this kind of in real time. What was that, 15 minutes ago, Wes, as we sit here on Wednesday at 2.38 p.m.? And so we'll dig around more on that. One interesting thing I did see that I wanted to pass along, and I unfortunately can't properly credit who put this out, but apparently in the transfer portal tagged with a do not contact um, note, that is a little notation. Obviously, when you go in the portal, uh, your, your information, schools can recruit you out of that and know that you want to be contacted. He put the do not contact on. So what does that mean? Does that mean he's going to – you know, he's got something in mind that he wants to do, uh, that this isn't just a, I'm going in and it's kind of open season. Don't know, and we'll have to see. So we will continue checking on that. Uh, but interesting news, and of course, if healthy, you know, Corey, a guy that from an ability standpoint, Wes has a lot, and I think could uh, certainly was expected to have a chance to contribute a lot next season if he was healthy. Yeah, and uh, I'll credit him. It was Joe Cook um, from Inside Texas. There you go. Uh, which is the On3 Texas affiliate site. Um, yeah, that's uh, – I don't know. This wasn't – you know, a lot of these you will hear some buzz about it beforehand. Corey, I feel like it was just kind of rumored – that he may look to leave like in the middle of the season, it was kind of rumored, but a lot of that has died, had died down a little bit. And a lot of times with some of these guys, it's just about playing time. In this case, I, I don't think that's it because he would have been in line to play a bunch, but you know, and Chris, was he among, again, we're doing this in real time. Was he among the graduates? Um, I think I do remember seeing that. Let me effort that to make sure. So it's not off the top of my head. That might be a little dangerous right now, Wes, with everything that we got. Yes, we got going um, on. Reason I asked is because someone asked. I thought it was a one-time transfer deal. Well, you can transfer. You have your one-time transfer, but then if you're a graduate, you can be a graduate transfer as well. So that's um, I don't know uh, something to keep an eye on there, at least to try to answer that question. Chris going to effort it. I do there. not see him on this list. On this so, one list that I have. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Still, do they still do the extenuating, extenuating circumstances thing where you have to apply? Yes. Um, they do. But would possibly be a situation where he might have to sit out a year. So we'll see. Again, don't want to speculate. Not sure. That's fresh news. But uh, certainly a guy, I mean, I'll, I'll say both sides of it. Not going to sugarcoat it because that's a guy that I firmly believe was in line to help South Carolina quite a bit in 2023. The other side, you almost have to just get comfortable with the reality. That you're going to have guys leaving your team. You're going to have guys joining your team. And it sort of, I, I think, just doubles down on the idea that South Carolina is going to have to go out and add a receiver or two. I think they were already going to be able to do that. But um, certainly, I would say, uh, accentuates that need to go out and, and add a receiver from the portal or two. So we shall see 
what that ends up being. Some Arkansas guys there, people mentioned in the chat. Um, you know, I, I think uh, a possibility there of South Carolina adding a couple of Arkansas guys from the portal. All right, man, what have we not hit, Chris? Shoot. Well, Shane Beamer and Dow Logan spoke for about, what, an hour combined, so I'm sure there's some other things we could hit on, um, but that would take all day. I, I think we hit the big things. Uh, recruiting this weekend. I'm sure some people are wondering who all is coming in. We should have a more firmed up list. I hope sometime between today and Friday. Don't really know exactly when that'll be, but expect some 2023 targets. There will be some official visitors who are still targets. Tyshawn Russell from Pennsylvania is one. Uh, Isaiah Johnson, the athlete from Virginia, is another. And there will be other guys to watch. And there will be some 2024 prospects on campus, too, is our expectation, potentially some transfer targets too. Um, that That's another thing to watch. So continually gathering information on that front and hope to be able to pass it along um, in the near future. Yeah, and South Carolina, Chris, now with a, I would say, a great story for a transfer running back out there. So uh, I think that's a position to keep an eye on for the Gamecocks. And, you know, I, I, I got a feeling they're going to be able to fill that role fill that hole um so we'll see we'll just see who it is and what it looks like but um i guess we didn't talk about the decommits um isaiah jada lots of buzz for him right now with auburn he has been i would say open to being courted by those other schools for some time now I believe he's going to take an official visit to colorado um so other schools heavily involved doesn't seem like he's going to end up at South Carolina. Obviously, he just decommitted, but sometimes you see guys circle back. It has felt like maybe it was a little bit more open possibility for a tree, Babalade, to circle back to South Carolina, but also some other schools heavily, heavily involved there with him. And it was one of those things where it was kind of a, a close commitment in the first place when he chose South Carolina. Close battle, I should say. And it'll be interesting to see if he does indeed make it back on campus um, at South Carolina before signing next week as well. Yeah, it will. That, that's the one, you know, Jada, uh, Auburn involved, like you said, Wes, Colorado in the mix. And I think there's going to be a visit taken there. Always kind of, I mean, early on, I mean, this has been for months now. What was he, a summer commitment, I think, Wes? So ever since the summer commitment, it's flown under the radar a little bit because maybe, I don't know, he's not a receiver or a quarterback or something like that. Um, pretty highly rated prospect, but it's kind of flown under the radar that he was still getting offers and still communicating with other coaches and still mulling official visits. And for some time, um, those didn't come to fruition, but they've started to now, right? And so – that's certainly opened the door, and he officially opening it up on Tuesday night. Tree, um, you know, interesting situation there. And you're right, that was a close commitment. You know, South Carolina was in really good shape, but then some others. I think I recall West Ohio State making a run. I think Maryland made a run, his home hometown school, right at the end before he committed this summer as well. And so, you know, we don't have a full picture of what direction he may go. But I have continued to hear the door still seems to be open there. And so if they can get him back on campus, uh, then we'll see. I think it's possible. It's probably going to be a pretty tight race, and it's definitely too close to call, too hard to call right here on, on Wednesday, December 14th, a week away from the start of the early signing period. Yes, there will be plenty to track on Gamecock Central and plenty to talk about right here on GC Live in the next week as South Carolina rolls into – the early signing period 2022 for the class of 2023. All right, y'all, that's going to do it. That's right at 45 minutes, but I think we covered a lot of ground in that 45 minutes. So we're going to get on off here, keep working on some content. Appreciate y'all's uh, support as always. Uh, it's been awesome. Great numbers again. Lots of people in the chat. Y'all are great for Chris, for Wes. We're out. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>